Signore e signori, buonasera. Buonasera. Welcome to New York University, Casa Italiana, Zerilli Marimò. It's my great pleasure to welcome each and every one of you here tonight, and especially to welcome back Maria Laurino, a good old friend of Casa Italiana. We had the pleasure of presenting several of her other uh, literary endeavors, and I couldn't wait for this evening. And uh, I, can tell that I can say that I followed this project from its conception, and since we're talking about babies and pregnancies, it, it's a very fitting metaphor. It was not an easy uh, pregnancy, and uh, I could witness Maria's characters and perseverance and stubbornness. <laughs> yes, you need to be stubborn to do what Maria did, and you also need grace and elegance and humanity, because you're really moving into some of the most delicate human relationships that you can imagine, and some of them denied relationships. And she handled all the tasks and all the meetings with her unmistakable grace. And I think this is a result of fierce historical research that didn't look at anybody's uh, privilege or position, and yet at the same time is filled with the humanity that Maria shows for the protagonists of the stories that she tells in this book. Uh, you have full bios of Maria uh, in... Uh, in the, uh, in the website of Casa Italiana. Uh, I just want to uh, remember a couple of her previous books. One is, Were You Always an Italian? There is a sort of a journey of self-discovery of her own being Italian America. And it's a quote from former governor Mario Cuomo, right, Maria? When you went to interview him about being Italian American, he asked you the question, Were You Always an Italian? <laughs> and it's a great book, including the part in which Maria is in Milan with her husband. And the other book is on the Italian-Americans, and I see that Maria tonight is seated next to John Maggio, who is the director of the documentary, The Italian-Americans. And the book that Maria wrote to accompany the series is a fantastic book. So if you have not read it, you're still in time, buy it, give it as a Christmas present. It's precious, it's great, it reads beautifully, and I cannot say anything else to praise it more than this. Tonight, Maria is going to engage in a conversation with Sabina Castelfranco, who is a 60 Minute and CBS producer based in Italy. She covers the Vatican a lot, but not only. So, and you might hear, I'd have heard her voice on CBS radio. Uh, and she's here with us tonight. And we are delighted that the conversation is going to be in between the two of them. And she's actually the one who unhurted the story and brought it to the attention of 60 Minutes. And here we go to the next segment of the evening after my very warm welcome to all of you. Uh, we're going to see a segment from 60 Minutes. Uh, and after that, there's going to be the conversation between Maria and Sabina. These aired not last Sunday, but the Sunday before. It's a, it's a segment of a total of about 20 minutes, correct? About 12. 12 minutes. And it's online. You can, you can watch it. And it's a very eye-opening, and it's a perfect introduction uh, to get your attention to the incredible research that Maria did for the book we are presenting tonight. Um, so stay here, of course. The, the, um, the segment, we're going to screen it immediately after. It's going to go on the stage, and we're going to have a conversation, and then there's going to be a Q&A for all of you to participate and ask the questions that I'm sure you have. Enjoy the evening. Thank you. Um, good evening, everybody. Um, I've come from Italy to take part in this lovely conversation. And first of all, I'd like to thank Casa Italiana for making this happen. Um, and then I'd also like to thank Heather Abbott, who certainly made this happen, <laughs> and uh, the associate producer, uh, LaCrae Mitchell, who helped make this happen. And thank you very much. And now I'd like to uh, start this conversation. Maybe, Maria, you can start telling us how it all came about. How did it all begin? Sure, absolutely. But just to add to, to Sabina, I, I again, uh, too, want to thank the CASA for this wonderful opportunity. I love coming here, as Stefano knows. And um, I just want to talk about, for a second, about the incredible opportunity I had to work with Heather and Lecrae and Sabina to have these amazing women who so got this story and did such an incredible job. So thank you, and it was really a gift. Um, how this happened, uh, it was chance. Um, you know, I think this happens with investigative journalism a lot. It's uh, a little bit of luck, and then it's a lot of work. And that's, that's what happened to me. I was uh, in my apartment 
put it off going to the gym. And um, my phone rang from my cousin, who I barely ever talked to. He lives in South Florida. He checks in you know, once every six months. And um, he was really calling to ask me for advice on how to get to, how to manage two airports to make a connecting flight, LaGuardia and Kennedy. And uh, in the course of it, said to me, you know, by the way, I, um, I recently joined this adoption group for people like me. And I said, he said, yeah, people who, you know, who were adopted through this Catholic church program. Now, we had known, we always knew in my family that my cousin was adopted, um, but we never knew it was through any Catholic church program. And then he began to talk about um, these stories he had heard, stories about birth mothers, stories about their children. And these stories were profoundly disturbing. And, and I, th I thought of the movie Philomena. I don't know if you've ever seen that about the Irish mother. It was so profound and, and so poignant. It had always stayed in my memory. And I thought, this happened in Italy? And then I thought, well, of course, it would make sense it happened in Italy. But how come we've never heard of this? And the journalist in me just said, oh my god, I, I have to find out about this story. And so I said to John, my cousin, um, you know, what can I do? Can you put me in touch with anyone uh, who could tell me more about this? And he said, well, there's this guy named John Campitelli. He said, he's, he's amazing. He knows everything. He even knew the flight that I came in on as a baby. And he said, he heads this adoption group. So um, I said, well, please, can you put me in touch with him? He's like, yeah, 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 I'll, I'll try, I'll try. You know, I, I got to go. I'm like, wait, wait, don't go. Promise me you'll put me in touch with him. Um, and he did. And meeting John kind of opened up everything. Yeah, and he has this Facebook page that is called Italia Adoption. That's and right. that's where it all started. And then you started digging and digging and digging. And you went through archival material. Can you talk to us yeah. about that a little Absolutely. bit? Absolutely. Well, John really opened up my world, um, because John has dedicated his life since he met his birth mother. Actually, John's story, John's story is so touching and poignant that you could see in a moment, while well, I knew from the moment I spoke to him while I had to write this, this book, um, he, he started searching for his birth mother when he was 11 years old. Um, and what happened with John, and he was in this very unique situation, which allowed him to open up this program, this never would have happened. He had these wonderful adoptive parents, they were artists. Um, they always wanted to try new things and they adopted four children from, the, the institution for the children of unwed mothers is known as a brevetrophia. And they're all throughout Italy. And they had adopted four children, three different birth mothers from these, this institution because they, they couldn't have a family. Um, and um, they decided that it would be a great opportunity to move the family to Italy and um, let the children learn the language of their birth. And then, artists, uh, and then the two of them could, could work on their art and they crafted these businesses to finance it. So um, at age 11, John goes to this train station and looks up names of and people. And they moved to Florence. They moved to Florence, excuse me, thank you. Um, and um, he's looking up names of people with the last name of Davi and calling them and saying, do you know anything about this boy born on this day? And of course, no one knew. So John had this whole personal story. And then he gave me, as Sabina as talking about the archives, he gave me this unbelievable tip. I said, well, I need to find these documents. And I was very worried because my Italian is really minimal. Um, I couldn't go to the Vatican archives. It would take me 20 years to you know, get through everything there with the level of my Italian. But the archives were in New York um, because it was run by the Vatican and the American Catholic Church. So they're not only in, they're in Manhattan. They're a 15 minute train ride from me. And it was just a really- That was very fortuitous. Very fortuitous, yes. <laughs> yes. And then you felt that although you had all these documents available to you, you really needed to take it a step further. So right. you decide to travel to Italy, correct? That's right, that's right. I didn't want to write a, first of all, I'm not a historian. I'm a, I'm a journalist and an essayist. Um, and so I didn't want to write just a book that was about the archives, even though the archives produced really fascinating information. I wanted to hear the stories. I wanted to hear the stories of birth mothers and the stories of their, of their children. Um, so yes, so I went off to Italy and, and began reporting. And you started meeting some of these mothers, or how did you find them, and what did you find? How was it to talk to them? I mean, were they open to talking to you? How did that Well, it was, it was interesting. Um, it was, I was saying to John when I was doing the, the research, and John was, was very fundamental in, in 
linking me and bringing me to people. Um, I said to him that, you know, I, I really wanted an Italian Philomena. <laughs> you know, I wanted someone who, the, the woman who was Philomena, who that story was about, and not the Irish unwed mother, um, was, she could come forward and she could tell her story and she could tell it without fear and using her names. And that situation did not exist in Italy. Mm -hmm. That there is such shame attached to the unwed mother um, that women were very, very um, concerned about coming forward. Uh, and in fact, Samina, if I, you don't mind me asking you a question, because Samina was also it was so integral to this, because she read the book early on and just connected to it, you know, in this way that was just so remarkable and wonderful. Well, I felt that it was a story worth telling and that people in Italy didn't even know about this. In fact, I think people still don't know about it. And although you managed to publish the book first in Italian, which was also very strange. I mean, Maria <laughs> had literally done all this work and then she couldn't get it published in the US and had to publish it in Italy first. And I think, yes, uh, the shame exists and still does exist. And it was very shameful for all these mothers to have their children out of wedlock. And it still is very shameful for them to tell that story. Um, and, you know, and I think it's great that you were able to then, you know, collate all this information. But when you then went to meet some of these mothers, uh, were they, how was it with them? Were they able to talk to you about it? Um, well, you know, some were brave enough. Um, and they were, and it, was, and it was really wonderful having the opportunity to meet them. Um, there's one birth mother, her name is Leah Maria. And her story was, was really so, so touching to me. Um, she gave birth to twins and um, was not expecting that and uh, you know, had very few resources. Her mother was an alcoholic. Her mother basically said to her, go to the Brevitrofio. You know, and she had a younger daughter too. So the mother was taking care of the younger daughter. Um, and she never expected to not raise her children. Um, she thought she was going to the Brevitrofio to get some help. And um, at one point, a social worker said to her, can, can you use some more help? And she said, oh, yes, yes, I can. And she then remembers being taken to a notary and given this form to sign, um, and which she signed, uh, something she rues to this day. Uh, and then she, she ended up at three months, she left the Brevitrofio to look for work and take care of her daughter because her mother was an alcoholic. So she would go and visit the institution, um, visit her children. And she shows up one day, and the children are gone. And she says, where are my children? And they said, well, Senora, you signed the form. And she said, what form? She said, the form. You signed the form. She said, the form. I thought that was for some temporary help. And they said, no, that was the relinquishment form. So she's now you know, out of her mind and, um, and, and basically spends her life trying to track down these children. And what was really interesting was putting together these kinds of testimonies with the archival research. Um, because after hearing her story, I went back to the social worker reports about Milan and what the institution was like. And I read in the report, she tells me that um, she discovers her babies are sent to Canobio, which is on the lakes. Um, and she's also told that her son is given, his, being given his last rights. So she also doesn't know if her son's alive. Um, and she has no access to them. And it says on these, the social worker reports that if we detect the interference of, of birth mothers, we send the children to Kenobia. And that was a real unbelievable moment for me um, to see, you know, to read these documents and just feel the pain of these women and then see this in black and white that actually there was a plan. You know, the interference of the, of the mother, isn't, isn't it the mother's child? <laughs> and, and let's talk about that whole plan and program that was created by the Vatican. Yes. I mean, initially, it was called uh, Orphans of War. War Orphans, yes. War Orphans. And so what was the objective of that? And why was it called Orphans of War? I mean, there weren't any orphans here by the sounds of it. Yeah, yeah. Yes, it was always. Um, so basically, this program began in 1951, as you saw in the clip. The first children were sent over. And the, you needed a mechanism, right? How do you send children to the United States? 
The legal mechanism was the Displaced Persons Act. And the original Displaced Persons Act of 1948 defined a war orphan as a child under 16 who had lost both parents to the war. Um, none of these children fit that. In 1950, there was an amendment added to the Displaced Persons Act. And one of the reasons for this amendment was that Congress knew that there were American families who wanted to adopt children. And so the amended definition said that it was a child under 16 years of age who could have lost just one parent to the war or the parent disappeared and was unable to provide care. And in those words, disappearance and unable to provide care, you have described the men of Italy <laughs> because they, they disappeared and they were not willing to provide care. Um, so that was the mechanism to call them refugees. And they came to America as these little refugees. So, and, but it was a packaging tool, right, to say they were war orphans. Well, who doesn't want to adopt a war orphan? You know, the adoptive parents feel that they're doing this amazing thing. Um, but then as the years went by, I still, I read these nuns referring to war orphans in 1955, these babies. I'm like, how do you figure that the war ended in 45? I mean, how do these Italian women keep producing war orphans? But I think we need to also describe the kind of scenario that Italy was experiencing at the time. Sure. Because there are still people who today would say, yes, but you know, the Catholic Church actually was doing a really good thing. Mm -hmm. um, they were providing families to, to children that weren't going to be looked after. So I think that the whole uh, background needs to be described. Uh, what was Italy like? And maybe Stefano can also uh, help us with that. Yeah, well, it was, you know, it was a war shattered country. And there was clearly, there was great poverty, there was disease, disease was running rampant. Um, there was also, it was also a time where um, the, the, the mores were changing. I mean, there was such dissolution, social dissolution, because of the war, that people were like, they were escaping fascism, you know, and they wanted to start breathing again. And Pope Pius XII, the Pope at the time, hated this. There are speeches that, you know, you can find in, in newspaper articles where he talks about women wearing bikinis on the beach, and this is because of the communist influence, you know. So he blamed all of this on the, the emerging uh, communist party in Italy. So several things were going on. Um, it was a time of, of for sure, tremendous poverty and, and people you know, needing help. Um, but it was also a time where the, the stigma of being an unwed mother was really, really heightened. The, the Pope started a moral crusade throughout the 50s, and he used the Virgin Mary as the figure, as the ideal mother. And basically, we're telling Italians that this is what, who they had to look to. He, um, he canonized a young girl who um, escaped being, she, well, she was, there was an attempted rape on her. And she chose to not, to just accept her rapist's knife. And she died. She was murdered. And the Pope's message was, it was better to be, to die than to be defiled. So if you could imagine with this going on, what the stigma was like and what these women had to go through. Yeah, and also we mustn't forget that there was no birth control there, at yes, the time. Absolutely. Um, so there, I mean, you know, women just got pregnant. Yeah. I mean, whether they wanted to or not, you know, there was nothing they could do to stop themselves getting pregnant. Yes, absolutely. And there was a fascist law that was still in place, um, which so if you had if you possess birth control, um, you could you could actually be jailed for even possessing it, or if anybody gave you information about it. It's beginning to sound a little creepy, like we can sort of hear this today, you know? Which is another part of the story, but we'll get to that. <laughs> yeah, so the narration of the time, and, and then the, the issue of anonymous surrender, I think we need to describe that a little bit, no? Yes, yes. So um, something that it'll, well, one thing, this another thing culturally that just really fascinated me about this story is that we all think of Italy as the land of mama and bimbini, right? It's like, oh, the Italian mother, what's you know, greater than the Italian mother? Um, but it became very clear to me that you had to be a certain kind of mother in order to raise a child in a very traditional, strict Catholic society. Italy invented the wheel of infant abandonment. They invented it in the Middle Ages in the 13th century. The idea spread to all of Catholic Europe and Russia. So the idea was that an unwed mother was not supposed to raise her child. The, the church at first said that they invented the wheel to prevent infanticide. 
that this was a way to stop this and that we, they would keep babies in institutions. But what happened was it became a mechanism to control the reproductive behavior of women. And this went on for centuries. Um, the priests were that would go to the midwives and ask them to report all out of wedlock births to them, like they were the Stasi coming in, you know. Um, and then these mothers were forced to to abandon their children to these institutions. They had the institutions had a 50% higher death rate than the general population. But the idea was, if you entered the institution, you would be baptized, and even if you died, you'd be able to go to heaven as opposed to be raising be raised in sin. In the 19th century, reformers thought these wills were barbaric, and they had them closed. But the institutions remained open, what became known as the Brevetrofio, mm -hmm. and the mechanism of anonymous surrender remained in place. And they create untraceable babies, right? You send these kids to the United States. If you are anonymously surrendered, it says that your mother has consent not to be named. What the church then does, or this the state registrar of births, is they falsify birth certificates. And they, for centuries, Italy gave them the children, like in, for example, in Italian, my book is called Il Prezzo degli Innocenti, because the Innocenti was the name given to the children abandoned to the Florence foundling home. That became such a stigma attached to that that they changed the names and they became more generic names. But the, these abandonment wheels actually, we all experience a part of this in the United States and we don't even realize this. And the example that I always love to use is, if you were abandoned to Naples, um, you were called an esposito, that you were abandoned to a public space. What is the American pronunciation of esposito? Esposito. So anyone with the last name of esposito can trace themselves to this foundling home system. Um, so that's how prevalent it is, and part of Italian life, which you know carries itself to to America. But these, all these children that finally were adopted in the United States, you know, over three thousand seven hundred, you know, John Campitelli in our story is certainly a very fortunate man. At the age of twenty-eight, he was able yes. to hug his mother, um, but that has not been the same with many others. I mean, what are the problems that still exist today for some of these adoptees to be able to locate their natural mothers? It's nearly impossible. I mean, John, John is extraordinary, and John continues to help adoptees. And today, see, he's doing it through DNA. But it's still hard to do this with DNA searches. John's story is unique because with his parents moving to Italy, he became bicultural and bilingual. And the whole first part of my, my book talks about his story and his journey because it's a fascinating one. He came back to the United States when they were in high school. He went to Cornell University, and he got very involved in computers and in the language of computers. So he has been able to, um, and then he went back to Italy, and he used all those tools. And he always he used to read you know, Sherlock Holmes when he was a kid. He loved detective stories. And he really, really did this un amazing search to find his birth mother, and he, he finally did. But it's extraordinarily hard, almost impossible, for a child who's been anonymously surrendered to find those parents, unless you get a little lucky with DNA. Yeah, and, and what exactly are the problems? Why can't, and there's also a very strange law that yes, exists in yes. Italy today, and maybe we can explain what that law is. Absolutely. The, the records are all sealed. I mean, you cannot get these records. And in Italy, which is unbelievable, is they seal these records for 100 years. So, I mean, in these adoptees, they also want medical records. You know, I interviewed an adoptee. Well, you spoke to her too, Sabina, didn't yes, you, in Italy? Yes. Um, she had a um, severe form of uh, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. And um, the doctors had gone through all treatment, and they said, um, there's nothing else we can do. You, we have to have a bone marrow transplant. And she said, how can, I, uh, how can we get a match? I don't know who my family is. And they said, well, you have to petition the Italian courts. And she did, and they said no. Um, that she survived was a miracle. She, she had her husband was was um, killed because he was police chasing you know Italian ga uh, mafia. Uh, so she's left with three children, and she writes a will saying that her children please have them adopted all into the same home, because she knew what it was like for what she went through, and she went into a coma, 
And it was just a miracle that she got out. And today, she, she runs a, an adoption rights group in Italy. But, but these are essential things. I mean, you, you want to know your identity. You want to know your medical history. And these records are sealed. Yes, I've heard of stories of uh, one lady who, to find out, to get into her documents because they wouldn't allow her, she locked herself in a bathroom in the uh, archival area and waited until all the offices closed and stayed there the whole night long and then opened up all the documents to find what she was looking for. I mean, people go to all sorts of extents and measures to be able to, to find their natural parents. And certainly, I mean, I'd say that in Italy, uh, the law needs to be changed. Yes. Um, but also another thing that has to happen, I think, is that, you know, where are we at with the Vatican? I mean, the Vatican certainly spoke uh, with regards to the issue in Belgium. The Pope went to Belgium. But what has the Vatican said about the Italian situation? What has the Pope said about that? It's, they've been silent. And it's incredibly frustrating. Um, there was a... Uh, there was a scandal that broke in Belgium uh, last year at this time, like last Christmas, um, about the treatment of unwed mothers. And it was very, very similar to what happened in Italy. Because this is happening in all these countries. You know, In many countries, the, the, either the, the church or the state has apologized. In Ireland, the state has apologized for falsifying birth records. The Italian government has never apologized for falsifying these, these birth records. Um, but uh, so the pope went to Belgium recently and talked about, you know, condemned the situation, and also said some really progressive words about how, um, you know, there, sometimes we follow certain social mores, and that's wrong. And the way these women were treated um, was wrong. And it's like, well, but this happened in Italy. Italy invented the system. Italy spread the system. This has happened in Italy, and there's been silence. And did you try to get some sort of comment from the Vatican yourself? I didn't. I just did the, you know, I, I spoke to them. I, in terms of the a comment from the church, I wanted someone who actually had been involved in the program. Because I just, I knew in this kind of book I was writing, it was a kind of essay that they were just, you know, I wasn't, I didn't reach out for a comment in that way. So I interviewed a woman um, who was the orphan supervisor. Um, and she's 96 today. Um, she was about 91 when I interviewed her. And that was really, really fascinating. I interviewed her on several occasions and on by phone. She wouldn't, she wouldn't meet me. Um, but she kept sort of giving me information. But she was so proud of this program. And she said, you know, in my tenure, she was there from 55 to 62, we placed over 3,000 children. And, and when you go through the documents, they're very careful to refer to it as the orphan program. I would always, I'd have a great day when I would go through them and I'd find this. I found once a memo that said, RE, sending illegitimate children to the USA. I'm like, okay, that's what, that's, that's what I knew this was about. But nobody wanted to say that. They always wanted to call them the, the orphans. You know, Monsignor Landy was always the orphans. So I tiptoed around that question with her. And I said to her, well, you know, now, some of these children, you know, this was early on in my research. I said, some of these children were illegitimate. She's like, well, they all were. She said, she said to me, I never want to say never, but, but come on. They all came from the local Brevetrofio. And I was like, yes. And then she said something to me that was so chilling. She said, oh, you know, they were women from the South, and they came to the, yeah, oh, yeah, believe me, there was a lot of that. Uh, <laughs> and they came north, and then we met the firemen, and then they met the policemen, and we got the children. And I was like, wow, wow. Well, CBS did try to also get a comment from the Vatican, and we I failed. I had to get the real pros in. <laughs> <laughs> we failed. Um, but you know, who knows? Maybe in our futures, um, you always have to be optimistic about these things. Now, um, there's one thing I'd like to ask you. In, in all of this research, I mean, it's taken you, it took you five years to write this book. Uh, you did a lot of research. Um, you came to Italy, you know, in all of these five years, what for you was the, the hardest thing that you had to deal with in all this? The pain of the stories, for sure. It was really, really hard hearing these stories, um, both from the adoptees and from the mothers. Uh, I think the story that 
got to me the most that I, I couldn't even tell my I would, you know, my, my poor friends have been hearing about this for years. Thank you all for being here tonight and your support for me. And I would start crying when I, when I told these stories. Um, and one of them was this woman was adopted by also a child of the Brevetrofio, but adopted by an Italian couple. So she didn't come to the United States. But I had to tell her story because it was so profound. Um, she was told that her, um, she was told by an aunt, an adoptive aunt, that her mother uh, abandoned her in a basket in front of a church. And she thought, well, why would I ever look for the woman who abandoned me in a basket in front of a church? So she never thought, really thought much about searching, but always felt, her parents didn't tell her she was adopted. She always felt a beat off. She always felt she didn't look like them. She, she just didn't believe she was their biological child. So after her father died, she went back to the, to the, she went back to the aunt. Um, no, actually, actually, that's when the aunt told her for the first time. Then her mother died. And the, when her mother died, her adoptive mother, the aunt said to her, so are you gonna look for your, your mother now? And she said, well, aunt, why would I look for my mother? She abandoned me in front of a church. And the aunt said, well, maybe that wasn't really the story. And she said, oh. And she said, well, they told, your, your parents told me that um, they heard that both your birth mother and your birth father were told that you were born dead. And when she heard that, she said, I want to look. And she started this adoption search. She was very lucky because a lot of the Italian courts prevent you from the files, but the court in Florence followed this decree from the European Human Rights Court saying that she could look for her mother. And she discovered when she met her mother that her mother not only had been told that she had died shortly after birth, but um, the mother started asking the nuns questions because she then went to another home for unwed mothers run by nuns where she learned to trade. And she kept asking her these nuns questions. And other young mothers were, I guess there were a lot of dead babies that everybody was being told this. Other young mothers were being told the same thing. So the nuns took three of them to the cemetery in Bergamo in northern Italy and brought them to graves and told them that these were the graves of their children who in fact had been given up for adoption. And it took me many years to be able to tell that story and not start crying in, in the middle of it um, because it was, it was so unbelievable. And there were other times, I mean, it wasn't just me. I needed a translator because I, I could not interview these women in Italian. My Italian is mediocre at best. Um, and one of the, the translator I was working with, we were doing a Zoom and the woman is telling her story and my translator's crying. And I'm thinking, okay, this is gonna be really bad because we haven't even gotten to the translation and, and she's gotta stop herself because she's in tears. So that really was the hardest thing. It was taking in all these stories and thinking about it. And thinking about, you know, it, it was, to me, it was beyond just this, this, this story as horrible and as profound as it is. But, you know, when I began this project, it was 2017 and Me Too was just starting. And one of the, the early ideas about Me Too, you know, how you had these ideas from the academy getting into the hashtag, was that you needed to understand the structural roots of this historic mistreatment of women in order to ever be able to stop it. And that was a huge thing, that, a huge part of the story that fascinated me. What were the structural roots? What was this anti-feminism that was, you know, been going on since the fourth century Catholic thought that was coming into this? Um, and then I began uh, to see that this not just was an ancient story, but these ancient ideas were coming into American political life today. And that was another whole thing that kind of blew my mind. <laughs> yeah, and I, and I think I'd, I'd really like to know what your opinion is about what's going on in the United States today. But before maybe we t go into that, Maybe you'd like to read a couple of excerpts of the book. Sure. And then we can go into what it's like in the US today. Okay. And what the questions are during this election. I happen to have the book with me. <laughs> <laughs> but I may go to the podium because it's hard to hold this. Thank you, Samina. That would be great. OK. Um, this is, I'm gonna read from the opening of my book and a short passage from the concluding section. Turin, 1963. The handsome city that greeted Francesca from the train station, with its elegant arch porticos and wide boulevards humming with prosperity, should have awakened something within the pretty dark haired 23 year old arriving from a small provincial town in Southern Italy. At another moment in Francesca's life, 
The Po River would have beckoned her to wander along its edge as it glittered golden in the midday sun. In another time, Francesca would have entered one of the city's famous centuries-old cafes, replete with gilded mirrors and marble floors, inhaling the experience in the joyful fashion of the discovering young, with long breaths and beating heart. But when Francesca arrived in Turin that spring, the season of her disappearance had begun. The previous fall, Francesca had worked as an olive picker in Puglia, one of a long line of peasant farmers who for centuries har harvested this local crop to be pressed into oil. She gently shook the branches of the small trees, coaxing the plump, ripe olives onto the tarp beneath her feet. It was tedious work, the days long and hot, but one night she earned a small reward. Her boss, whom she had a crush on, offered her a ride home. Francesca was delighted, but hadn't anticipated the route her boss would take, down to the Azure Sea, stopping at a thatched trullo, the traditional stone hut of the region. This particular trullo, run as a bar and inn, had its own tradition among the local men. At first, she tried to hide from her mother, from her mother, her slowly changing body, denial the only strategy for what happened that night. By four months, however, their small house, bulging and swelling with shouts and recriminations, felt ready to burst. Francesca listened, but could no longer hear, cocooned in her own thoughts and desires. One thing was clear. She had no choice but to leave the village. The train ride to Torn was excruciating over 15 hours in a stuffy carriage clamoring north. In the tight space of the enclosed cabin, Francesca sat opposite her older brother, a carabinieri stationed north who had traveled back home, determined to bleach out the stain now saturating the family. She stared out the window at the arid land, endless swaths of honey and brown, that became a misty blur as her brother unleashed his fury. Disgraziata! His demeaning reproaches declared in the name of moral authority and fraternal duty, hung in the air with a heavy, nauseating sweetness, like a cheap cigar. You are the ruin of the family. The season turned to fall when Francesca was sent to Torrance Maternity Hospital in a special section reserved for sinful women. The woman who carried her baby for nine months who bore through torturous labor a son, Piero, a name she had chosen months before, who nursed him for a precious few days and who desperately wanted to keep him, was about to be erased. On the floor of the maternity ward, she had a name and a child, but four days later, she possessed neither. In the days and years ahead, she would need to find another chamber in her heart, one devoid of the unbearable grief of relinquishing her firstborn son. Her son's Italian birth certificate sealed from prying eyes for the next century, preventing mother from ever learning about son and ensuring that son could never find mother read Nato di donna che non consente di essere nominata, born of a mother, born of a woman who does not consent to be named. It made no difference that Francesca remained in Torn for three more years to be near her baby, working as a nanny for a wealthy couple and imagining Piero in the face of the little boy she nurtured. It made no difference that Francesca repeatedly returned to the gates of the foundling home, seeking to take back her child. Make peace, woman, the mother superior finally told her, determined to put an end to her visits. Your child has been sent to America. He is with a good family. It didn't matter that the nun's words were false, that Piero had been earmarked for a particular American couple and would remain in a sterile room lined with cribs of crying babies for another two years before paperwork was completed and with visa acquired to allow for the international adoption. Nothing mattered because Francesca was now a ghost. In the eyes of the church, nameless and childless, she had officially disappeared. And now from the concluding part of my book. I am a Catholic, the surrender form began, words reminding her who she was and how far she had fallen. I sign the present document of my own free will without any compulsion or coercion. Did she hold pen to paper with shaking hands? Could she comprehend the pages of legalese before her? Was her signature any choice at all? Or the response to centuries worth of stimuli, sermons, liturgies, icons, hymns, a call to her faith, family, ancestresses. Imagine a favorite symphony that you could never recollect on your own. But once the music plays, you are humming the opening of the next movement in the silence of the orchestral pause. The chords have been registered into the depths of your soul. Who composes the music that determines the most intimate decisions of a woman's life, whose voices are ultimately heard? In Enrique Villamatas' novel, The Logic of Cassell, 
A narrator resembling the Spanish author recalls his last visit to the wonderful city of Turin in northern Italy. I've been struck by how contained and elegant that place was, actually a French city due to the long shadow of the House of Savoy. Etched in my memory was the serenity of its daily life, which one sensed as the dangerous creator of unexpected absurdities, Villamatis continues. The great Italo Calvino, Torinese by adoption, saw in this perfect geometric city an invitation to logic. Torin is a city that entices a writer toward vigor, linearity, style, he wrote. It invites logic, and through logic, opens the way toward madness. These descriptions came to mind as I look back on the two long decades of the orphan program and the importance of this logical city cultivated by the tree-line design of Napoleonic rule to its success, supplying one-third of the babies to America. Madness and absurdities had coursed through the veins of the entire country during this fervent time. Nuns in Bergamo leading young mothers to mourn at fake graves. Milanese social workers shuffling to the lakes of Canobio, far away from the pesky interference of birth mothers. Trans World Airline stenographers recruited in Rome as escorts for toddlers on endless piston engine flights. Yet Torin, industrious and rational Torin, to borrow again from Calvino, delivered the product best. Vernon grounds in the warble of bird song outside the institute. Nannies cloistered and disinfected by infrared shower within. Babies whose temperatures and feces were inspected daily. Toddlers made to sit idly for hours in chairs, rocking with unbridled ferocity. He enjoys rocking himself, as the social worker wrote of John Campitelli's toddler years. And to increase the movement of the rocking, he pushes more and more energetically with his feet. After being selected for America, the children were shepherded to Genoa for medical examinations and visas, later placed on economical overnight trains to Rome, where they would meet other children, arriving from the connected arteries of the Brevetrophy in the north, south, east, and west. Together, they spent their last night in Italy in a convent run by friars, which the church charged for the rooms. The next day, the orphan program staff cleaned up the kids and handed medication to the adult escorts to give to the children for their long flight ahead. Um, in New York, excuse me, followed by their first night in New York at the Luce Chelsea Hotel, where they roomed near adults who probably had their own stash of drugs the night before. <laughs> all those crazy logistics, all those lies, all to take babies out of the arms of unwed mothers. The logic of illogic. And thank you for that, Maria. And just to get back to our uh, question just before you started reading, um, so how do you think everything that has happened, um, you know, equates to what's going on in the U.S. today um, and the upcoming issues uh, that are being discussed during this election campaign? There's sadly a very, very direct and profound connection. And I kind of discovered this along the way, which really, really stunned me uh, in, a whole, in a whole other direction that took me, that I took, this book took. Um, which is that, uh, I think it was around 2019, I was reading an article in the New York Times. And it talked about how there were these things called safe haven baby boxes. And they were boxes in which women could anonymously surrender their babies in the United States. And I went, oh my god, that's, that's the Italian abandonment wheel. How, how could this be? And I started to do some research, and I discovered several things. First, there are now about 250 of these boxes. They're, they're high-tech versions of the ancient abandonment wheel, where you can now anonymously surrender your baby uh, into a temper-controlled box in a fire station. So um, in, in America, beginning in 1999, um, the Right to Life movement began a push for something called safe haven laws. America never, you have never been able to legally abandon your baby. We used to not believe in this. We used to try to find ways where mothers can help their children and mothers can protect their children. But the Right to Life movement started saying that there was, gonna, there was a huge number of cases of maternal infanticide, which was crazy. And maternal infanticide is always horrible, but there were 37 the year the first safe haven law was passed, um, which is a really, really tiny number. There are so many other reasons, like low, uh, you know, low-term birth weight, um, pregnancy complications and diseases that account for infant mortality. 
And this kind of, you know, the infant infanticide is like nothing. But anyway, they, they passed the first law in Texas. It was called the Baby Moses Law. They passed it in 1999. Remember, Columbine also happened in 1999. So if we're going to talk about children's deaths, we still haven't passed any legislation on gun control, any meaningful legislation. But in the next six or seven years, in every state in America, safe haven laws were passed. And they were passed with bipartisan support because Democrats did not want to be accused of supporting the baby in the garbage can. Right? So they're being told, you have to stop babies from being put in garbage cans. OK. So now there's safe haven laws in every, every part of the country, a copy of the medieval Italian law. When Samuel Alito overturns Roe v. Wade, he writes in his um, opinion that there are certain modern developments. I, I thought I was reading a George Orwell novel. There are certain <laughs> modern developments that obviate the need for abortion. And one is the passage of safe haven laws. So he has cited this as a means to overturn Roe v. Wade that the United States has a law that you know, Italians are stuck with. They can't, they'll never change it. They've had it since medieval times. And we now have it in every state in the country. And then during oral arguments for Dobbs, Amy, Amy Coney Barrett was asking questions. And she said at one point, well, if a woman can have an abortion at 23 weeks, why can't the state ask her to carry it for 15 or 16 more weeks? What about safe haven laws? And so the idea is that the right wants to have a national ban on abortion, and that if you can't take care of your child, you carry it to term, and you surrender it for adoption. And now you could surrender it for adoption anonymously. So in effect, these, these, these children of the future will be going through exactly what these Italian children who came to America went through of never knowing anything about who they are while, while they're taking reproductive rights away from women by saying that this is the solution, this is the answer. So it's really, really terrifying. And I, I just, you know, I started the story wanting to talk about these, the kinds of structural roots of this treatment of women, but I never realized what a profound and direct connection it had to today. It's not a story just of 600 years ago with the wheel. It's not a story of 60 years ago with when these kids came over. It's a story of right now and how women are being treated. And you certainly didn't realize this when you started your research for this book. No, no. This all just keeps happening. <laughs> yeah. well, thank you. Mm -hmm. And now I'd like to open up to any questions from the public. And maybe, I don't know, I can pass the... Oh, OK, great. Thank you. Thank you so much. Congratulations, Thank you, Josh. Maria. I remember. I remember when you first told me about this story so many years ago, yes. and your commitment to it is inspiring. Really, Thank just because I didn't see it when you told me, but <laughs> I see it now. Just have a quick question about the other side of this equation: the, the, the parents who adopted, the American mm -hmm. parents. Mm -hmm. Did they have any idea where the children were coming from? Did they go to the church and ask for children? Like, what was that mechanism, and were you able to meet any of them? Yeah, and I, I did spend time talking to John's adoptive mother, who was a wonderful, she has, has passed away since, uh, since then, but she's a, a wonderful uh, woman, and she was really, really open about everything. You know, the adoptive parents were just caught in this. They, they didn't, you know, they knew very little. They went through their Catholic charities. They were, you know, they, you had to be a childless couple. That was the criteria. You had to, uh, Monsignor Lenny said, you had to have impeccable Catholicity, whatever that means. Um, and, um, and they were just you know, told that these, these children would be coming you know, from Italy. But one and, thing that's interesting, Maria, is that some of these children didn't want to upset their adoptive parents in the United States. So um, it was often the case that they'd wait until their parents, the adoptive parents, were no longer alive and then start searching for their natural uh, parents. Is that, that's correct, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, no, that's absolutely true. Um, yes, because, you know, it, it's the, the old saying, you know, always a slap in the face to the adoptive parent to do this. Adoption has changed a lot over the years, particularly in America. Almost, not in every state, but now there are open adoptions where you can find birth records and where you can find this kind of information. Um, but that certainly didn't exist. And, um, and they, they knew very little. Right 
Thank you so much. It's just fascinating, very moving, obviously. Well, we had the opportunity to visit the Hospital of the Innocents in Florence yeah. last year. Mm -hmm. And what struck me listening to you is that the idea then was they left tokens yes. for yes. the mothers and they would cut them in half and the mothers would then be able to come back and reclaim the child for the, what happened to that idea, first of all, and then more of a comment, isn't the Prime Minister of Italy an unwed mother? Yes, I think that she is an unwed mother. Thank you for, for bringing that up um, because that's a wonderful detail which I would love to talk a little bit about. Um, it's uh, another such a, unbelievably poignant thing. Um, yeah, it's really worth, um, if any of you are Eleanor Ferrante fans that have been watching the HBO series, um, in the, uh, in the, <laughs> um, in the, the second part, or was it the third part, where it was mostly in, in Florence, it took place in Florence, as a place setting, whenever the camera returned to Florence, they had a picture of this, um, of, a, of a child, the ceramic glazed child in robes, and that is from the Innocente. That's where that is. That is what marks the museum. And you see them from the outside. Yes, yeah, Del Robbia. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, Thank yeah, you. Yeah. And, um, and that's, this is the museum. And uh, yes, I think the most touching part of this museum is they have these drawers that slide open, 140 drawers. And in each of them are things that the museum has over 1,000 in its collection, thousands, I think, actually. But they are, what the custom used to be is that when you surrendered, when you abandoned your child, the mother hoped desperately that she could get the child back. And so they would like cut a piece of a crucifix and she'd have one piece and then the, she'd give the other piece to the, uh, to the museum, to the, excuse me, to the institution. Um, and these are just relics of this horrendous system where of course these babies were never reunited and these pieces just sit there. Um, and in fact, Anna Arecchia, the, the adoptee I told you about who needed the bone marrow transplant, the way she knew, she told me, that she had to find her birth mother was that she found one of these. They're called um, uh, de conoscenti, um, the, mm. the like, okay, I'm forgetting the Italian word. Riconoscimenti? Yeah, the, um, the segni, segni di conoscimento. Segni di riconoscimento. Yes, yes, Sign, these signs of recognition. And her mother had a, a, a Madonna, picture of Madonna that was torn in half. The mother had kept, and she, and Anna told me, she said, as my translator was try, crying before I could hear anything. Um, no, Anna was saying to me that, you know, I knew when I saw this, uh, I just knew my mother wanted me. She wanted me back. Um, and so the, the, the museum has this really um, very, very sad collection of these, of these relics. When did they switch to getting rid of well, you know what's really interesting and also really, really creepy? Um, those, I think, mostly stopped in the, in the 19th century. Um, but that's actually not true. I think it really depends on the region, because Anna was born in 1964. And she, but she told me she's the only adoptee who ever, uh, she runs this adoption rights group now. She's never met anybody of her generation who's had one of these, but she had one of these. But in going back to today and safe haven laws, um, some of these states that adopted safe haven laws used to have a policy that you could have like an ID bracelet that you could then give to the, to the institution that if you wanted to get your baby back. And it was a copy of this Italian idea of the Senni di Riconosci. Thank you. <laughs> My Italian help. It's a difficult word. Thank you. <laughs> jo Joanna? Maria, as usual, you are brilliant. And this is such a powerful emotional story, thank you. I have this question for you. The church in its perniciousness is vast, but did you come across any of the stories of the fathers who disappeared? Because, of course, this is one of the most horrible parts, yes. that these men would use these women yes. and then abandon them. Yes, thank you for raising that, because it's really, really important. Um, another incredibly sad story um, was of John's adopted sister, Sarah Campitelli, a different birth mother. Um, Sarah was raped by her professor. She was being tutored by him and um, trying to pass a, a woman, another woman of the South, 25 years old, tried to become a teacher, had to pass this rigorous exam. And um, 
and she fled, and she went to Torin um, and uh, you know, had to surrender her baby. I interviewed her second daughter, who told me how she said to me, my mother hated me. She said, I knew my mother didn't hate me for me. I knew my mother hated me because I was not the child she abandoned. And, she, and so this trauma passes through generations. So Sarah tried to search for the father and, and meets him, goes down, the professor, the famous professor, through, she contacted his son and he, he, he believed her. She told him the story and that morning he went to see his father and he told him the whole story and that Sarah wanted to see him. And so he said, what do you think? And the father said, no, impossible. And the son came to Sarah and said, it's very possible. So, <laughs> um, and um, so she went to his house. She, she actually came as a guest. They, that was a different scenario. She didn't go that day to just start to talk to him and not let him know at first. They introduced her as a friend from Florence. And uh, finally, he wasn't saying anything. And uh, the, so the son decided to fess up and said, you know, actually, Papa, Sarah is the daughter of Tonya. And he said, oh, yes, I can tell. Same olive skin. Uh -huh. Sarah would like to know if you know, you're, she, he would not say anything. He would not acknowledge it. And the only thing he said to her was he came up to her. He was, I actually don't know his name. I didn't use his name. But he was known by, his real name was something else. And he walked up to her and he said, I just want you to know that my name is Michele. And that's the only thing he ever said to her. And I said, Sarah, how did you respond to it? She says, well, she says, I guess he felt that this is all he could share to me, that uh, that was the name that was real, his real name. I mean, it was, it was so outrageous. It was just un unbelievable. Um, but these men, they were not held accountable, and society didn't hold them accountable, right? It was, they, they wanted, th this was all about women. The burden was on women. And if you read some of these documents, the state also s refers to these children as the disinherited children. So that's another big part of the story. The men didn't want them getting their inheritance. And so it was just easier to have these disposable women. Right, all the burdens on them. They have to anonymously surrender their children, and the men get off completely scot free. Well, in the case of uh, John Campitelli's mother. Oh, that's a great story. Yes. <laughs> uh, mm. Let's tell the story about her brother. The you know the, the, the fact that the reason why she had to leave Puglia uh, because it was so shameful, and so you know the the brother was a carabiniere official in Puglia, and he said to her. You know, you've shamed the entire family. You need to get out of here. You need to leave this place. And, and that's why she ended up in Turin, which is where then uh, she gave birth to John Campitelli. Right. right. But then when he met his mother, she told him who the birth father was. Oh, yeah. So he goes to meet the birth father. And um, the birth father's run out of town by the Carabinieri. He goes to another town. And the birth fa father looks at him and says, oh, I'm not your father. It's, it's your cousin Frank in, in, uh, in New York. And John's like, what? He's like, yeah, yeah, that was my, your cousin, my cousin Frank. And so to him, to this man who's living you know, in this small town in southern Italy, um, in Basilicata, he, um, he thinks, well, how is John ever going to find somebody in New York? New York is this vast place. Well, he doesn't know John Campitelli. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and John <laughs> finds us. <laughs> and John finds us. So, so he says to, he says, well, where is he? He says, well, he's in New York. So John goes back to his favorite tool in his toolbox, the phone book where he started looking for Davies when he was 11 years old. And he discovers that Frank um, lives 10 minutes from where he grew up in Poughkeepsie before his family moved. So what does John do? John goes to the town and, and, and says, hey, anybody know this Frank? And they're like, oh, yeah, Frank with the butcher shop. Sure, go over there. So he goes to Frank's house. And Frank just looks at him and says, your father sent you here, didn't he? <laughs> And, um, and, you know, just couldn't believe it. And then finally the father fessed up when he traveled back to Italy. He said, I, I met Frank. You're my father. Just following up on uh, Joanna's question <laughs> regarding the men, the very institution of the Ospedale degli Innocenti that was brought up very brilliantly, and it's at the base, as Maria was remembering, the whole wheel of abandonment, uh, was established for the will of a merchant that belonged to the art of silk, and was paid for by the Art of Silk. The endowment was created. The Art of Silk was mostly merchants that would travel extensively 
and they would have children both in Florence and when they traveled abroad. So basically it was a way for them to have an institution that would take care of their indiscretions. So the very origin of an institution that on one hand had a, a role and, and, and somehow raised these kids, they prepared them from adoption. Most of them were adopted indeed. They were not destined to remain in the institution forever. But it was built for basically providing a solution to the problems that these men created. Um, and it's a beautiful solution because the building was designed by Brunelleschi. At that time when they did hospitals and uh, uh, institutions like this, they chose the best architect and it's beautiful to look at and it's the Della Robbia Randalls, but it's a story of deep sadness caused by men that would not face the responsibilities and they thought that the best solution would be institutionalize the answer to your problems. Uh, I was a foreign service officer with the US Department of State mm. at the embassy in Beijing from 1993 to 1997. And my best friend was actually the consul general in Guangzhou. And he was in charge of actually providing visas for these adopted children, for the Chinese children that actually were adopted to bring to the United States. Uh, he was a trained lawyer. And one of his main concerns was the fact that he felt very strongly that some of the documents that accompanied the children were forged. Mm -hmm. So he made an effort to try to make sure the authenticity of the documents, because there were actually people scouring the Chinese countryside for families that had two children, and actually were born essentially out of wedlock with the Chinese policy of one family, one child policy. So the question is, in your research, has the complicity of, of, of consular officers who are accepting forged documents actually ever been questioned? That's interesting. In terms, in terms of this program, um, Landy and his team, they wanted the consul generals to have no part in this. And they kind of worked around it so they would go, not go through the consulate because they wanted absolute secrecy. And they had fights, both with the consul general and also with the Brevetrofio directors, because these people wanted addresses, and they wanted to know where the children were going. The director of the Brevetrofio in Torin, I, there's correspondence with him saying, how can I, how can I not tell you know, the people around me that I don't know where these children are, you know, that I don't have any address? But the church wanted absolute secrecy. So in this case, they kind of iced out the consul general. So I don't think they were actually particularly involved. Um, Even though the consul generals had to sign the visa, the visa papers, eventually the visa papers had to be signed by consular offices and not called. Is that not true? Um, that, you know, I, I think that this was arranged that between yes, the Vatican the, and yes. I mean, I guess in the but that they would have been signed in Italy, right? They would have been signed. Yeah. I don't think that they were signed by the Consul General because in all the documents they keep saying we do not want the Consul General involved in this, and I think that the ministries in Italy worked around that. Hi. Uh, so thank you for the book, which I'm halfway through. And oh, thank you for CBS for raising this, because I happen to be one of these uh, oh, 3,500 or so. I just found out this, figured this out this week. So thank you. Um, and from, I I, from the program? Yes, yes, exactly. I just didn't know, and there was dead ends everywhere. Of course, I have my name, but a name doesn't mean anything. No, right? So uh, yeah, so it was super interesting. And I'm curious. Um, in your investigation, what documents actually exist here in New York? Because you live here and it's so easy to get. get. And the other uh, question, I did go to the Municipio in Mamarateo, where I was born, and I went to the woman, I was getting my passport, and uh, Rosa, at the time, said, uh, she looked at me and said, you're not here to find out your parents, birth, your birth parents. And I knew I should say no to that, right? And I uh, said, no, no, I just want my passport. So it seemed like there was information that she could see because she was asking me. So I just wonder those two things, uh, information here and information at the local municipio. Uh, you know, useful or anyway, yeah. Uh, 
Yeah, so I'm sure that information there exists. Week. They're just not they're not sharing it. Yeah. Um, here in the the archives that I worked at, it was uh, primarily correspondence between Monsignor Landy and Camorra, um, who ran Monsignor Landy's office in Rome, Monsignor Camorra's office in New York City. Um, there were orphan program reports where they would talk about, you know, they'd give these weekly summaries. Of, they wanted to send more children than they could. You know, there was always many, many higher numbers um, and, and detailed reports about that. Uh, there are the flight manifests where they, they have thousands of children in the flights. That's how my cousin was able to say to me, he even knew the flight I came in on as a baby because John has copies of all of these. And he, if you're an adoptee and part of his group, he'll say, well, you were on KLM flight done. Um, so that kind of, that's the kind of information um, that, that exists in, in the, the Center for Migration Studies archives. Thank you very much. It's a wonderful uh, talk. Um, I have a question. Did, did this, um, if, if someone became pregnant and they were unwed in southern Italy, I mean, really southern Italy, and they didn't have a brother who could bring them to Turin, what would, would this happen as well? Or was it more prevalent in the north? No, there were private trophy all over Italy. All over. Okay. All over, yeah. I think the word got out to some women in the south that Turin had a, you know, a, you know, a, a good institution. Um, and that, you know, I, why these unwed mothers? Yes, I mean, some of them may have come, as Virginia Fermica said, because they traveled north. Um, but yes, in John's case, he had an aunt in Turin. And then he had the brother up north, so they brought him. Uh, in Sarah's mother's case, the woman who was raped, um, someone decided to bring her to Turin. But, um, but no, there were institutions throughout, in, you know, in Naples, in every, in every region, Sardinia. So even if it, those examples seem to be the woman doesn't have money and the men do, but in this, if it, it would also happen if the woman became pregnant by somebody who wasn't wealthy? Oh, sure. Were their children well, I mean, still taken? Well, actually, they were the most vulnerable. Okay. okay. Uh, yeah, I think it's important to talk about the sort of social class system. If you were really wealthy, you could do what you want, mm. I, like always, <laughs> right? So those women had all the choice. Those women had all the power. And they were, if you were really wealthy, um, you, you know, it didn't, the social stigma, it didn't really affect you in that way. Um, but if you were middle class, if you were poor, if you were working class, you were really affected by the stigma. And if you have no family, if, you, if mothers turn against their daughters, if fathers turn against their daughters, this is your only choice. And sometimes it was the men who were wealthy and the women who were not. And so these wealthy men who would get these women pregnant would find a way to move them away from where they were. And the wealthy women would, out of a sort of a sense of noblesse oblige, would give to these institutions. The Agnelli, Susanna Agnelli, would give these generous donations. Um, and so, yes, you also had this kind of, uh, well, they could do anything they wanted, and you know, there could be as many affairs as, as you know, anybody wanted in the Agnelli family. They were trying to help these women by providing funds for these homes for unwed mothers. Maria, well, I have a qu another question following up to this. In your, in your study, in your research, uh, the geographic distribution of the women, that is a follow-up to this question, actually. So it's mostly when you talk to the woman, lady lawyer, the 96-year-old that she told mm -hmm. you, they're all women from the south. They come up north and meet the policemen and the firemen. Um, do you have any idea of the distribution of these unwed mothers whose children who stay, were taken in terms of where they came from? So we're even because it seems from this narrative that the women in the, now, in the north were, were actually mostly women from the south that went up north. There and were also were, women from the countryside in the north. The, there from were, the countryside yeah, of the north. Yeah, so yeah. equally distributed. Yeah, and yeah. John, John Campitelli actually has very good figures. I mean, he has, uh, I know that he has details of how it was distributed in Italy. And, so and this happens. There is data. Yeah, and this, this happens. I'm interested because it happens at the time of the so-called internal migration, mm -hmm. after the mass migration from Italy abroad, mostly to this country, but also to Latin America. After World War II, you have the economic miracle that was 
a miracle that happened at the expenses of the people that were forced to migrate from the south to the north. Right. So women moving from the impoverished south to the industrial triangle tour in Milan and Genoa was very common. They yeah. would have not been particularly uh, visible in terms of, of this movement because it was a massive movement of millions of people yeah. that moved from the south to the north. So they, their, their motion would not be under the radar too much. But, and, and then you would say women from the north, especially from the countryside, mm, yes. that were yeah. part of this thing. And the records in the south just aren't as, they're not as available, which is, of course, historically it's been the same way too in terms of documenting the history of child abandonment. Most of the records exist in the north. Thank you. We, we have neglected the, 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 the right, not for any political reason. Yeah. <laughs> yes, here. Yes. I'm definitely. Francesca. <laughs> Hello, I am Francesca, and I am from the south of Italy, Palermo, and we do not get pregnant. <laughs> we just don't. Or they, if they did, it wasn't in my family because basically they throw themselves off bridges. It wasn't accepted. And this, my family came over in the 1900s, or early 1900s. And the history is that we don't talk about below the belt ever, ever, ever. You are to be white, like mapin white. That is the way we talk about it. And it's really interesting how it stigmatizes and it really affects, it affected a lot of women in my family who were, couldn't have babies because of maybe a tipped uterus or something like that, would not get the operation because it was land that shouldn't go to, be gone to by a doctor. And so this, this is, inherited trauma through centuries, and it was brought over to the United States. I was embarrassed. I went to Catholic school all of my life. I'm very Italian, Brooklyn Italian. And these are things that just, it, it, it's covered up. And even now, it's making, it's making me excite. Like, I'm, I'm almost 60 years old, and it still makes me, like, crazy mad. Mm -hmm. So this is really something that I'm so glad that you talked about because I know people in America whose fathers committed suicide, whose daughters committed suicide because of the shame in the 50s and 60s. Thank you. Yeah, it made me crazy mad too, so I had to write the book. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. No, but yes, it does. It it's still here. And it also goes back to why there's no Italian Philomena. That's so hard. Yeah. Thank you so much for unearthing this story. Um, but I think it's important to point out that long before safe haven boxes, there were the same issues in America, the stigma and being sent away to a home for unwed mothers yes. and all of the women who just regretted ever having to do that. And also the records in most states still, adoption records are sealed. The child is looking for the parent. The parent is looking for the child. They're absolutely sealed, except in certain states. So I think it's not just Italy. It's not just the church. Absolutely. The church may have invented it, but. Um, well, the ba baby scoop era, that's what it was called here. What was really interesting is I was reading about the history of adoption in America, and one thing that I thought was, was amusing was that in the 1950s, well, also the, the history of adoption changed in America in the beginning of the century. Unwed mothers were kind of expected to raise their children. It may have been looked down upon, but they thought it was the parents' responsibility. Historically, if you look at the rates of abandonment, in Protestant countries, the rates of abandonment are much lower. Because while they didn't like the idea of unwed mothers, it was kind of the Anglo-Saxon, you made your bed, now keep to it. Um, and that was once the, the feeling in America. In the 1950s, because there was a growing number of teenage pregnancies and there became a class issue with that, that's when these women, what we now know as the baby scoop era. Um, but social workers at that time, would, there was no religious word. It was not about excising sin or all the language of the, you know, Maria Goretti and everything. It was about, they used Freudian language. They used these sort of bastardized versions of Freudian language and said these teenage mothers were neurotic and that's what this had. They had these pregnancy complexes. So I just thought it was, it was very funny how the, the outcome was the same, but one was using the terms of religion and the other one was using the terms of, uh, you know, pop psychology. Hi, Maria. Hi, John. I don't know if you're, how are you? Good. <laughs> Just to give you a little footnote on the woman, the 96-year-old. Yeah. When we were with John, heading to Turin, 
she keeps a black book on every child. She remembered me. She yeah. said to John, where are you going? And he said, oh, I'm, we're going, I'm with John Snee. We're going to the, to the institution. And she said, oh, I remember him. He has a, uh, just to let you know, he has a brother. <gasps> While really? we were in the car driving. Are you serious? <laughs> wow. Uh, yeah, John found both of my brothers. One I met, one didn't want to meet me. Wow. Yes, we have a, two questions back there. One, Teresa here. Teresa, raise your hand. Teresa, raise your hand, yes. And then behind you, Teresa Fiore. Thank you so much. Uh, more of a technical question. Why is it that you couldn't publish the book in English and you did it in Italian <laughs> first? <laughs> well, it, was, it was a very long story. It was a very unusual story. Basically, what happened was when I started researching this book, um, I had written a proposal and, um, and I, I basically left my publisher because I couldn't get along with my editor, but that's another story. <laughs> and, um, and when we were shopping the proposal, it was just a piece of luck, of sort of fortuitous luck, that um, my agent's sub-agent from Italy was in town, and she said, what's cooking? Um, and my agent told her that um, you know, there was a story and that eventually it would be, she thought it would be very interesting to the Italians. And um, my, the, the woman said to her, the agent from Italy, who's American, but she married an Italian, um, and she said to her, um, well, why don't we publish it here first? Because I think Italians would be fascinated by this story. Um, uh, you know, and, and she said, well, Maria can't write Italian. She said, no, 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 this doesn't happen that often, but they will, they'll translate it. Ask her if she's interested. So she asked me, and I always wanted my work published and translated into Italian. I always wanted that. Um, and um, so I said, sure. Uh, and uh, we tinkered with the proposal, and we made it more Italian. And she felt that the Italians would be very interested, and she was right. We sold it at auction to Italy. So it came out in Italian first. And that you know, was just a very, very unusual thing. And then we tried again to sell the book to the Americans, which became much harder this time when the, the book was completed. And it was, you know, people were, the publishers were saying, this is, you know, this is an interesting story, but it's about Italy and it's about 50 years ago. So it just, it just took a while. And, and uh, as a matter of interest, it's not only in Italy and in uh, the US now, but it's yes. going elsewhere. Yes, yes. I've been. It's it's coming out in Poland this, in the spring. I've been told it's the lead nonfiction title in Poland, which I'm delighted by. Uh, I just signed a contract for Portugal uh, a couple of days ago. So so yeah. So it's being translated and it's getting out there. And Maria Sabina, correct me if I'm wrong. Following up to this question, also uh, John Campitelli's story came out in Italy, and he he, he was able to trace back. Uh, who his mother was, thanks to an Italian newspaper that published an article about l'ingegnere americano che cerca sua madre. So it's, it seems like, like a pattern. In Italy, there is an interest for these stories, and your book was very well received, and you went on a tour, and maybe you want to tell us something about yeah. the kind of uh, reception that you, that you had. Well, the Italians are very interested in the story. Um, you know, Vanity Fair Italia ran a profile of John, and um, the uh, journalist from Vanity Fair Italia told me it was the, the number one online story read in the, in the magazine for, the, for that month, and they were really stunned by the kind of interest. Um, because Italians do want to know the story. Uh, it's just, you know, getting it out there and getting more people to kind of pay attention to this, because there is just this pervasive silence that is, you know, that is there, um, and is very, very hard to break through. Um, so that's, that's been great. I mean, those, those kinds of stories are great. But uh, yeah, there's, and there's still no response from the Vatican. <laughs> we had a question right behind Teresa. Yes. yes. Um, hi, I'm asking this question on behalf of my friend Bernadette, who's in attendance virtually. She was adopted um, out of an orphanage in Rome and grew up in Brooklyn. Her adopted parents were told that her parents died in a car, her original birth parents died in a car crash. Um, that ended up not being true, and she's reconnected with her birth mother actually a year and a half ago, who turned out to be Irish. Yeah. Um, but she has, and there's reasons for that. Um, but she's, I'm asking this question on behalf of her. Um, did you ever see documents suggesting that a child was sent to the USA, but Italian records show that the child is still living in Italy and someone collecting government funds for the child? Mm. Um, 
she, that's what her records show. She said she was listed as being an address in Rome until 1984. Hmm. No, that's very interesting. Yeah, there, there's, there's such confusion around this. And where the, when Leah Maria, the birth mother I talked about, when her son turned 18, the, the, the Italian police came to the door and said, your son's supposed to be in the military, where is he? She didn't even know if her son was alive. They had told her her son was getting his last rites. So there's been that kind of, kind of confusion. Um, yeah, I had never heard of that. That's, that's interesting. But thank you for raising the question on behalf of your friend. We're also receiving questions on YouTube for people that are watching live. And I'm reading one from Leonor Paletta that says, hi, I'm one of the adoptees. Thank you for telling our story, Maria Laurino. Uh, Yeah, we have a question there. Oh, we have one here. Okay, it's getting there. For me. Um, hi. My name's Carrie Ann, and I just want to thank you so much for shedding light onto adoptees. You may have heard of the PBS special, The Reckoning with Korea also influenced the Baby Scoop era. I did not know I was part of the Baby Scoop era until I met a wonderful group of adoptee writers, adoptee voices. Uh, we have a, a blog, an e-zine, and um, it's been incredibly uh, validating to know that a non-adoptee cared about us. I was adopted by an Italian-American family, and even though I was not part of this program with my um, brothers and sisters who have been bravely speaking, um, while I'm reading your research, my own search of a closed adoption in New York State is in the margins. Mm. And it was because of Andrew Cuomo that right before the pandemic in New York State, in the United States, I was able to see my original birth records for the first time. And the father's name is left off. So I can't tell you what an important moment this is for all of us. And um, where there is silence, there is shame. And you are helping all of us break through that silence. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you for sharing that. Hi, congratulations on your book. I'm looking forward to reading it. Um, drawing on the structural roots that you recognized, um, in your research, you went, um, did you find anything interesting about like the patriotism that maybe these families that took the kids um, that adopted the kids, was there a sense of patriotism of, of them like in recent, um, not recent, but in other uh, immigration programs like the Pedro Pan operation? I'm not sure if you're familiar with that, but between 1960 and 1962, unaccompanied minors, my mother was sort of involved in that, came over. I had interviewed um, Monsignor Walsh about the program, and that was a Catholic program through Catholic Charities. So my question, I have two, que two questions for you. One is, were, did the American families that went through the cha Catholic Charities, did they feel like they were being patriotic of some sort, like adopting the children, mm -hmm. like the Pedro Pan operation? Yeah. And you said you had another question. Or oh, and then the Pedro Pan, op the Pedro Pan operation still to this day meet up and reunite with groups. Do these children also do that as well? Because that would be so wonderful. Yeah. Um, on the first question, I, I think there certainly was this sense of patriotism, because you have to think about it, you know, America was the victorious superpower. And they also advertised it that way. There were pictures of, you know, on Monsignor with a capital behind him. And this was this idea that the war orphans were coming over from Italy. Um, and, you know, yeah, and then they would, you know, have these ceremonies where they'd be, you know, become American citizens together. And so I think that was, that was clearly a part of it. Um, in terms of adopting, uh, reunions. I think this is the the collective, and and John and other adoptees that are part of John's group can really talk about that. I mean, John Campitelli is like this. You know, he helps people. He helps adoptees find their re roots. He's a kind of a curator of their collective grief. You know, where you have this this forum. Um, I remember early. I would go through the, the the post, and I remember once early on, one of the adoptees. Because you express anything. You express your anger, your grief, your your, you know, your search. And one, the one that got me was there was one adoptee who posted a picture of, uh, 
uh, one of the handmaids from the, the television adaption of Margaret Atwood's Handmaid's Tale, just with a caption underneath, Mom. You know? <laughs> so it's a, it's a forum for lots of, lots of different ways. No, but also you did find that there was a cluster uh, in Ohio, oh, yes. in Steubenville, and uh, Mary Rilotto, it was one it. of these mm -hmm. that was in the CBS piece. But in any case, they do uh, gather now and again. They have met, various adoptees have met, particularly those that ended up in the same areas. And they, they have, you know, come together. Yeah. Some of them were at the same schools. And but but they and came they didn't through. Even know that they didn't even know that they were adopted ch children. Yes. But as this goes on, won't the church kind of be forced to unseal? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> I, I'm just saying, like, even the voices. I can tell you. It's you. I can add one little. Yeah, you must, Heather. Please. <laughs> Heather is the, Heather is the CBS producer, producer who that this. produced this segment among other things. I, I spent uh, at least four weeks pestering the American Catholic Church, the Catholic Conference of Bishops in D.C. They um, refused to answer any questions. They claim these are closed adoptions. A hundred year rule will apply. And that is what they're hiding behind. The Vatican slow walked our uh, inquiries. They knew when we were going to air. They, you know, were making the right sounds about making, you know, they were going to, they were never going to help us. So that's at least what I can tell you. <laughs> but it's pretty, you know, in all of in all of this conspiracy of silence, what we means pretty amazing, Mary, is that you basically had unfettered access to the archives of the yes, Catholic Church yes, in New York. Yes. <laughs> and an amazing, you an were, amazing. You were archivist. either very skilled or well, very charming. <laughs> very skilled and very charming, I'd say. You know what, I also, there was an amazing archivist yeah. who, um, she actually wrote to me after the segment came out, because we filmed in the archives, and I said to Heather, I don't know if she knows what we're doing, <laughs> that we're bringing the cameras in here. And she wrote to me and she said, Maria, I saw the segment, and I thought it was a very interesting presentation. I particularly love the puzzle graphic. <laughs> so she's just sort of quirky. She said, and then she, she said, well, you know, it was a very segmented program, and a lot of times the nuns were caught in the middle. And so I just thought, I'm not going to, you know. But then she, she signed the note saying, and I welcome you for your next research project. And I was so touched by that, because she is a true archivist, you know? And um, so anyway. I, I, she, I asked her if she wanted to read the book. She said yes, so I sent it to her. But that was that was key. Mm -hmm. Hello. Yes. Yes. Okay. You have a question. You have a question. Oh, that's okay. I just wanted to say thank you for writing the book. It's been a long, twenty-year search for my husband's biological family, and I just wanted to let you know just a little piece about John Campitelli. He's so he's such, we tease him all the time. We tell him you know he's a detective. Truly, <laughs> he. Um, we looked, he, he looked very, um, for it, my husband, he found my husband's mother's grave in, in the cemetery in Italy. And he, apparently there was like a little light on the grave that is paid by electric, you know, f electricity. He said, someone's paying that bill. Oh. So he researched to find out who was paying that light bill. And that's how we found out my wow. husband's biological family. That's a great detail. Wow. Thank is. you for sharing that. You know, John's, John's, a, John's adoptive mother um, had a, a no television rule in the family. She wouldn't let the kids watch any television. They went crazy over this. And she said to him, everything you want to know in the world, you'll know through books. So he grew up reading Sherlock Holmes yeah. and Robinson Crusoe, and he basically kind of embodied both. The Sherlock Holmes, he's always been a detective. And then he felt that he was stranded on an island. And he was looking for his Friday to help him. And he, it took him a long time to find that. Yeah. <laughs> so your cousin John from Steubenville, who uh -huh. started this whole thing, yeah. did he ever find his family? John didn't want to look. You know, there was a, um, as Sabina points out, there, there, I spent, a, I did a, a part of the book on Steubenville. It's called the Steubenville Cluster. Because another thing that John Campitelli found, which was really interesting, was that in, in two areas, in Pueblo, Colorado, and in Steubenville, Ohio, there were these large clusters of children 
uh, over two dozen kids came to Steubenville from the, the Rebbe Trophy, which is kind of astounding. And so there must have been some Catholic connection that, that brought them there. Um, so I, I did a Zoom with um, about five of them to try to you know, get a sense of their stories and, um, and talk to them about their searches. And out of the five, three of them, either one of them was Mary Rolato, um, all searched for their birth mother. Mary was the only one who was successful. Um, another adopting named Tess found her mother had died, and Marco has never found his mother. And my cousin John and another John called Columbus John. I had so many Johns, and I was like, so I had Columbus John, cousin John, you know. Um, Columbus John said, um, you know, I, um, I always thought, I've always been curious if I have any siblings, but I had great parents, they saved my life, he was a very sickly child, and I just thought, I don't want to open a can of worms. Cousin John falls in, I don't want to open a can of worm school. Marco retorted, I'm a can opener. I'm an asshole. <laughs> I, want to, I want to open that damn can. And, and I think it's just very interesting in the, you know, this, this delicate alterity of the adoptive child. Some want to search, some don't. Some are the can openers, some don't want to open the can of worms. And my cousin John is, he doesn't want to open the can of worms. Maria, would most of these Italian kids be given to Italian-American families? Yes. Because the, the condition was that it had to be a Catholic family. Yes. But was it impeccably Catholic Impeccable family? Catholicity, yes, yes. Uh, but were they given to Italian-American families only? Predominantly. And the right. Order Sons of Italy was very involved. And they were like, we have two dozen kids. You know, we've got a bunch of families out here in the Midwest. So they, they got the Order Sons of Italy. The idea was, yes, that it would be the Italian-American. It wasn't all, but, but predominantly. And then in the late 1950s, the International Social Service, which is the Italian, it was a branch of the Italian Red Cross in Italy, they got involved and they wanted to start sending babies and the church was furious. They were so furious, there was a memo saying, we're going to bring Cardinal Spellman in if this continues. <laughs> um, because ISS didn't, mar didn't, didn't matter to them if there were civil marriages. And in the church, you had to have a church-sanctified marriage. So they only wanted them going to Catholic couples, impeccable Catholicity, and mostly Italian-American couples. You save them from limbo in Italy, and you send them to hell in the US? Of course, <laughs> they, they wouldn't want that. No surprise well, there. We have time for a couple more questions. Of course, Joanne. I, we screws up. No, no, no. <laughs> Maria, I just wanted to say that there was this other story in my family. There was this other view. And Francesca, I'm partly addressing you, because anch'io, you know, sex. Didn't hear the word till I was 23, I think. <laughs> had already had sex, but I don't think I had heard the word. But in any case, and my, that we were like, oh, no sex until you're, you know, the whole thing. But my grandmother told us a couple of things. One, now we were from Basligata, way up in the hills. So we were back of beyond, right? That when a woman had a child out of wedlock, she came in 1910, so we're talking pre-1910. That baby, there was a tree in the town where that baby would be left for the family, who families who could not have children. And that was their social structure. Wow. Also, Kuma Marie is the daughter of the priest of the town, so yeah. there was that other kind of leeway. You know, there was these funny systems. John and, found that too. Right? Yeah. And then the other thing was, that my grandmother, who was very strict with her daughters, said to her daughters, when some daughter of a friend got pregnant, we will be the first to go and visit because we will stand by her. Mm -hmm. So it was this double yeah. view. Yes, yeah. There was this compassion, at least. And these were rigidly ruled people. Anyway, I want to just put that side of it there, too. That is a great point. We have another question back here. Uh, hi, uh, John Shimano. I used to work for the Child Welfare League of America, so I'd, I'd love to talk to you about some of the history. Actually, the baby abandonment laws have a more positive aspect to them. They were an alternative in the 80s to states being more punitive, especially as the teen pregnancy rates went up, of not prosecuting uh, young mothers who maybe abandoned their children. 
but uh, talk about that. But also in terms of how things have changed and things in terms of adoptions in the 50s and earlier, it was always important to match the child so that they looked like the family. So, you know, you, you would try and only place them in, especially if they were Catholic agencies. So, and we've certainly moved away from a lot of that, especially the idea of letting an infant grow up for any period of time in an orphanage or any kind of orphan setting, what we know about brain development and the need for close contact uh, for that infant at the very, very early. So I'd, I'd love to talk to you at some point in terms of, you know, what you've learned and what, you know, what our laws were. I, too, have heard one of the stories of, uh, well, there's a very famous American poet who was part of that Belgian group, um, and her father was a priest, and her birth mother was his assistant while she was getting her PhD. And it was a very sad story because she was sent to America, and she was going to be adopted by the priest's brother, but she looked so much like him that it became impossible, and she ended up um, being put in this double alcoholic family. It was horrible. Colette Inez, very famous American poet, who wrote a book about it. Um, but I was wondering how the program ended. Mm, uh, good question, yeah. It ended um, by 1970 for a couple reasons. One, um, Italy had changed its adoption laws to make adoption easier. Um, and Italy had very strict adoption laws, um, which of course people get around because it's Italy. But, um, but it was you had to be uh, 50 years old to adopt a child by exception. They went to 40. Um, and what many, many Italian couples did because they wanted a child and that didn't fit into the strict laws, there was something called an affidamento, which was this kind of arrangement where you could have, it was a kind of a guardianship for three years. And you could have the child, yes, and then the child would, you could adopt the child. The church couldn't do that because they wanted a more a quick solution, so they couldn't use the solution of affidamento. But in 1967, the adoption rule um, was changed and it, uh, it made it much easier, so there were more adoptions. But most importantly, um, social mores changed and birth control became legal and abortion became legal and the institutions closed. So they just shut their doors by the, through the 80s. There was the last, sort of the last of the institutions. Maria, I don't think we had such a lively and engaging discussion mm -hmm. after a talk in, in, a, in a while. It's, oh. it's amazing. Thank you for, for being here with us tonight and thank for those of you who brought their stories and who wanted to share the story. And say this. <laughs> there are books upstairs, and Maria will be happy to sign them for you. I see uh, many uh, new faces that I don't see normally here at the Casa. You're double welcome. If you want to be on our mailing list, you're going to be bombarded with invitations. We have <laughs> an event every night, but most of them are exciting, fun, engaging. So we do everything from film screenings to uh, theater, to conferences, to concerts. You name it, we have it. it. Related to Italy, but not in the strict sense. We are very ecumenical. <laughs> Italy includes all Italian Americans, all Italians around the world, all people who live or not live in Italy, but happen to be from somewhere else. So do sign up. Uh, there's going to be an iPad somewhere at the back, and you can just leave your email, and we're going to make sure to include you in our mailing list. Maria Laurino, thank you so much for the work you've done. And, and like the archivist, we'll be here for your next book. <laughs> and John, you're one of the greatest documentary makers in America. Oh, thank you. You know what the message is about. Right? Oh. <laughs> Let's encourage John Major to, to look into this. And Sabina, Heather, and the team at CBS 60 Minutes, thank you because, of course, your segment, your story, helped a great deal. Made the story, and thank you. Grazie.